Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the latest in our series of careers webinars brought to you by the Hertfordshire Opportunities Portal. That's hop into H H -O -P -I -N -T -O .co uk, which is a website that's available for everyone to have a look at. And it contains lots of really good and detailed careers information, specifically about careers in Hertfordshire. But it also allow you to access all sorts of other information that you might want to find out about future careers. These sessions are predominantly intended for students in Hertfordshire schools, but we know that there are people from outside Hertfordshire that will be watching this or will be watching it back later via our YouTube channel. And we hope that the information we cover in this one will be of use for anyone interested in this particular career field. So today we are going to be exploring careers in sports coaching. The primary focus will be through football, um, but we think there will be um, a lot of information for you for anyone interested in careers in sports coaching generally. I'm delighted to have an inspiring and informed panel for you today. Uh, so we have Laura Fig, who is the Higher Education Strategic Lead for Watford Football Club's Community Sports and Education Trust. We have Carl Lingham, who is the Chief Executive of Hearts Football Association and Richard Bulling, who is a football development officer at Watford FC Community Sports Education Trust, like Laura. He'll be able to talk to you about his own particular journey into coaching. Throughout the session, we hope we will be able to inform you about the opportunities available to you within this career. We'll talk about who this career suits, probably who it won't suit as well, <coughs> and the different routes that you've got um, to get there. A few bits of housekeeping, first of all. There's not many of you watching live today, so we really um, encourage you to interact with us and to ask questions. Pretty much guarantee if you want to submit a question today, it will be answered. We will be able to answer it for you. Um, just to make you uh, or reassure you, we can't see any of you in attendance. So it's only the four of us that are visible and audible. Any questions you ask, you do that on your dashboard, on your screen green you should see there's a tab on there that says questions if you click on that that will open up a brand new box where you can type in a question via text it will only be visible to me and then i will forward that question on uh, to one of our panelists if there's anyone in particular that you want to answer the question then do direct it to them otherwise i'll direct it to whoever i think would be um, in the best position to answer that one uh, so please interact and please um, submit your questions for us. This is your opportunity to really find out a little bit more about a career that I'm sure you're quite interested in finding out about already. First of all, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to introduce themselves. So starting with Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Fig. Um, so Gareth said I'm Higher Education Lead at Watford Community Sports and Education Trust. So we've just set up a brand new foundation degree in football development and coaching, and it's in partnership with Middlesex University. Um, do you want a little bit more about me and my background, Gareth? Yeah, tell us a little bit about you, Laura. Yeah, um, so I actually did a BTEC in sports science after, after my GCSEs. And um, I really always loved playing sport. I didn't really want to do A-levels. I wasn't massively academic. And um, so, yeah, I chose a BTEC. Um, my tutor, when I was doing my BTEC, pushed me to go to university and uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I picked sports injuries because that was something that I really enjoyed during my BTEC. So I did a, a degree in sport rehabilitation and injury prevention. Um, and then following on from that, I did set up my own sports injury clinic for a little while. Um, and I did that part time alongside working as a duty manager of a gym, um, actually the gym at Middlesex University. So whilst doing that, I also got my master's degree. Um, previous to that, I also worked as a business support manager for Proactive North London, which is like a, a county sports partnership for, um, for North London. And um, whilst I did my master's then, I, I started doing a bit of teaching on the side at Middlesex University, a bit of sessional teaching and assessments and those kind of things, really enjoyed it. And then a role came up at Tottenham Hotspur Football Club for the foundation um, for a higher education lecturer, or was at the time I think it was development officer, they, they called the role. And I thought, why not? So I went for it, got the job and um, all the sports injury stuff went out the window. and. Um, didn't look back though, really enjoy my role now. So I worked at Spurs for eight years, managing two foundation degrees and uh, moved on to Watford in October last year to set up this programme here. So that's me. Thank you. We're 
we'll explore various aspects of the things you just talked about there, Laura, as we go on through the session today. Um, Richard, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, so um, hi everyone, I'm uh, Richard Bullion. So I'm a football development officer for Watford FC Community Sports and Education Trust. Um, at the moment, what my main programmes are, which I run through the trust, are player development centres, um, holiday courses, and our match day packages are very football based. Um, all the activities are, are football based um, sporting activities. Um, in terms of my roots, I started as a college student um, on a BTEC course through the trust, so through Watford Trust, um, doing um, a BTEC course. And then I did my level one and level two coaching badges on there as well. Um, after I finished college, I then went on to Southampton Solent University and studied football studies with uh, business for three years. Um, after that, then I went to America to do some football coaching for six months. Um, and as I mentioned to you before, I obviously landed Hawaii as my location that I'd be coaching at. So I was actually in Hawaii for six months, which was a very unique and unbelievable experience. Um, once in a lifetime, probably opportunity and experience. Uh, once I come back, I'd have my graduation and then just started as a part time uh, coach with uh, Watford Community Trust again. Um, so going into schools, doing after school clubs um, and just working with like the school sports team. Um, and then we had a new community hub built, which is the Meriden Community Centre in Watford. Um, and they needed a football and sport development officer to lead on their sort of football development plans, sport development plans. Um, so I was there for about two years and then I got another role with with Watford Community Trust, which is now just a football development officer. So it's very my role's gone from sort of community um, engagement to very football focused now. And that's my journey pretty much Good. just before i move on to carl i think it's just worth picking up richard everyone i'm sure will be familiar with watford football club but what's the difference between watford football club and watford community sports and education trust yeah so um the main difference obviously we're the char charitable one that's linked to, to the club um and we're very much sort of about community engagement so sort of around improving lives um enhancing communities making a positive difference through sport um, physical activity and sort of health and well-being as well and um, so our main sort of um, areas of work at the moment is around health and well-being learning and social inclusion um, so obviously it's not uh, just you know academy training or player development training we're looking at mental health we're looking at fitness uh, social inclusion where kids can come to a safe environment for free and play football or different types of activities um, so the main difference is probably interacting with all and everyone. I think that's probably the main difference between the two, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll talk more about yeah. the particular type of coaching that you you need later on during this <laughs> yeah. session, Richard. Um, Carl, over to you. Could you tell us a little bit more about you and then just the work of Hertfordshire Football Association, please? Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Carl. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Hertfordshire Football Association. Um, I had a, a similar route in many ways uh, to Laura and Richard in that you start off with a, with a passion for sport and football, um, playing. My parents were in the Royal Air Force, so we had the benefit of moving around and I've lived all over the UK um, uh, and in Germany as well. So I was lucky enough to, to be able to play in all those uh, those different areas. So. A passion for football you think right well I want to work in football in some way shape or form it's only just dawned on me that I'm not going to make it as a professional so I thought I'd, I'd try and have to find another way to, to earn money so I started to do my coaching qualifications uh, I did my coaching qualifications through the Football Association of Wales where I ended up um, living uh, did my uh, all the way through up and to my UA for A license so I got my UA for A license did a short spell. I did four months in America. I didn't get a, a glamorous a spot as Hawaii. I had I worked in 10 states, um, Michigan, down to Kentucky, uh, all over uh, America. It's a fantastic experience, uh, uh, as Richard said, uh, once in a lifetime for me, certainly. But it certainly opened up my doors and gave me a real good grounding in terms of coaching. Then I worked, started to work for the Football yeah. Association of Wales um, as a part-time development officer did my coaching qualifications and ended up having two spells coaching the women's, the national women's team um, at international level on two spells, World Cup qualifiers, European qualifiers, Algarve Cups, et cetera, et cetera. 
I had to work with a lot of the, the senior players that are still playing now. And I managed Watford Ladies, or I coached Watford Ladies for a while as well. So uh, a varied group. I did a, a degree in uh, coaching development um, and administration and a, an online diploma through the Johan Cruyff uh, Institute as well. So, and only fairly recently, with the advent of um, online activity, um, it's it's much easier to do those kind of qualifications now and balance full-time work, if you like. Yeah. And so yeah, I mean, and Hertfordshire Football Association. What's what's your remit as an organisation? Well, uh, the, the best way to think of the the Hertfordshire Football Association is the branch of the the FA. So we're we're a local branch of Wembley, St George's Park. So we are one of 45 counties across England, five, another five if you include the Royal Air Force, the Army uh, and the Navy. Oxford and Cambridge University also have uh, county FAs. And we have a team of 17 people and our role is really to govern uh, the game in Hertfordshire. So anyone from adult football to youth football, women and girls, referees, coaches, facility development. We have a team of uh, 17 full-time staff based in Letchworth. Uh, so any any football activity in Hertfordshire comes under our umbrella. Okay, we've um, had a couple of questions come in already, so I'm going to ask you these ones. Um, and well, this one is very close to the question I was going to ask you, Carl, actually. Thinking back to when I was 15 and uh, football coaching and sports coaching was something I was very interested in and saw as a potential career. I know when I had the conversation with my parents though about oh this is what I want to do they told me really there wasn't a career in it so is sports coaching just a hobby that someone has or are there genuinely careers available for people? Well I think the simple answer to that is both but certainly you can make a, a career from football and sports coaching there's, there's no doubt about that now um, certainly there are more opportunities to do that in a football specific environment than ever before. Um, and uh, Laura and Richard will be able to, to tell you about some of the opportunities that are arising um, in professional clubs. Every professional club will have a community arm that delivers um, all manner of activities uh, that will suit a lot of individuals, personality types and skill sets as well. But also that there is the elite game. We can't that we can't ignore it. That elite, the elite game now is relying more on people who have come through an education background, as opposed to someone who's played 300 league games that drops out of retirement into a um, an academy or a, a pro club. So academies are run by uh, very academic people, very bright and intelligent people, and coaching is almost seen in many ways as teaching, another arm of teaching. So there are more opportunities in the elite game now for people who have come through an education background as opposed to a, um, a football, an elite path pathway. But also, you know, Richard and I have both had uh, uh, um, experiences of working abroad. Um, and whilst limited in its time, uh, there are further opportunities abroad now in terms of certain the states offer a, a whole host of opportunities to play and study but also to coach as well in some of the big clubs and some of the organizations that are right across the states so grassroots clubs as well finally grassroots clubs i think uh, certainly in our county with our big club network are starting to employ part-time coaches and i think in the next few years we'll start to see a, a whole network of full-time coaches employed by grassroots clubs Okay. Well, that's a very encouraging and, and positive <laughs> message and definitely something that we'll look into. I mean, on that theme, Richard, um, thinking about some of the projects that, that you are involved in, either directly or, or as an organisation, I mean, is it just football coaches that you have or, or what are the different types of coaches that you need? No, yeah, so there's there's loads of different um, programmes or projects that you can, you can get involved in. Um, so... In terms of my programs, very much football based, so the very much player development centres that are linking into the academy. Um, but you've also got school sports programs, so where you're doing PE lessons, so you'll be coaching up to 30 children um, with the support of a teacher through the Primary Stars program. We've got mental health programs now that obviously the amount of funding and um, sort of the knowledge in terms of mental health that's out there now um, 
we can do a, a lot in terms of mental health programs disability coaching um shape up which is exercise and um, social inclusion where you're trying to be like a role model and the kids come off from you know into a safe environment and you can coach so there's loads of different programs um, and there's also within each program i'd say probably coaches need different types of coaching style and also different behaviors within them programs so a player development session coaching wise would look a, a lot different to a disability or a social inclusion session so my main advice to the coach is if you are looking to broaden your experiences and um, I'd say try and be able to dip into lots of different programs to broaden your experiences a little bit. Yeah so what we're getting here is that you know, Carl's saying that there, there are careers and there are opportunities and then Richard you're then telling us as well that this isn't just for people who want to be football coaches or that's an element of it that there's lots of different branches of coaching that someone could go into whilst earning money doing it as well. So I think we're going to bring Laura in here as well. I mean, Cole, you've alluded to the Cole alluded to the fact that there are some academic routes into coaching now. So Laura, can you first of all tell us well, what is a foundation degree as compared to a, I guess, a standard degree? So a foundation degree is two years, um, and typically they encompass work-based learning. So it's quite practical, similar to an apprenticeship. You do. Um, some sort of work placement alongside your studies. Um, it's kind of seen as a, a good progression route on, for BTEC students because it's more practical and more applied. Um, not so much exams or things like that. It's a lot more practical as much as it can be. Um, but yeah, the key thing is they have lower entry requirements because there's less teaching and more doing, if you like, with the, the placements. And yeah, they're two years and you get that work experience so by the time you finish you've got a degree of some sort not necessarily a full degree but a foundation degree and you've got experience which a lot of employers take as um you know nowadays looking into employment if you haven't you might have a degree but if you haven't got experience it might go against you so the good thing with a foundation degree is that you've got the piece of paper but you've also got the experience to go with it to go straight into employment and then the other thing with a foundation degree is that you also have the option by the time you've done your second year, if you want to go on and do a third year to complete a full degree, a BA honours degree um, or BSc, depending what foundation degree you take, then you can do that. Um, you don't have to do it straight away. You can take a year out, two years out, work for a bit and then come back to your studies and do your third year and get it that way. Um, but you could also potentially then specialise in your third year. So um, with our degree, it's football development and coaching, Middlesex will offer a third year BA football development and coaching degree. Um, but there's so many different avenues at different universities now that are available and football is becoming really popular as a degree programme that there are probably, you know, if you want to go more into um, the kind of football science element of it or um, performance side of it, then there's options to potentially do a third year directly into that area as well. So you can get a bit of experience along your foundation degree and think, oh, I definitely don't like that and I do like this and this is where I want to take my career and um, and go and pursue it and get your full degree in that area. Okay, and then you said, so it's Middlesex University, which is the sort of university that underwrites or partners with you along this. So the certificate you're going to get would be, have full accreditation from Middlesex, is that right? That's right, yeah. So it's um, it's validated by Middlesex University. Um, our degree is in partnership with them. So you'll have four modules in the first year um, and four in the second year. Of those four modules, we deliver three of them in year one and Middlesex will deliver one. And in the second year, it's 50-50. Um, and then obviously, if you did want to go and do your third year, that's that will be 100% with Middlesex University or any other university that you might look to go to. OK, and then just thinking about the actual content of the of the course as well, what are the modules? Mm. What will people be studying? Okay, so um, of the, it's the four modules in year one and four in year two, there's kind of like a theme where they progress from year one to year two. So they have fundamentals of football coaching in year one and students, if they haven't already got their FA level one, will put them on that alongside the course for free. Um, and it's kind of it is what it is what it says fundamentals of coaching um it is football 
coaching predominantly, but there will be other elements, particularly sort of school sport and how that works will be thrown in there as well. Um, and then they have fundamentals of football development, which kind of encompasses everything we do as a trust, using football as that kind of driving vehicle to get people involved in other areas, whether it's health, social inclusion, um, employment, skills, um, yeah. So how you do that, managing projects, budgeting, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then you have uh, fundamentals of football performance, which is kind of more of the science side of things. So um, as Carl mentioned, there's a lot more jobs in the kind of elite end now in different areas, um, particularly sports science, those areas you need a degree for. Um, before, so that the, the performance module covers nutrition, um, physiology, biomechanics, performance analysis, and psychology. So five kind of hot areas at the moment in the more elite side of football. Um, and then you have a professional skills module, which gets all students, whether you're a mature student coming back to university or into study, or you've come straight from college or school or whatever it might be, the professional skills module gets everybody ready for higher education. So um, things like referencing skills, how to critique, how to write report writing, um, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and then in year two, all those modules just progress. So from fundamentals, you then have applied football development, applied football performance, where it just takes it up a level, and applied football coaching, where we'll put students on their level two. Um, again, if they haven't already got it, we'll put them on it for free as well. And um, a research methods module, which is really important if you wanted to go on to do your third year, um, most universities will require you to do some sort of dissertation. So having done a research methods module, it will prepare students for how to conduct research or to get an idea of what they want to do their research on if they do complete their third year. OK, there's a couple of questions that have come in that I think are very relevant to, to what you're just talking about at the moment. So firstly, have you got to be a really good footballer to go on this course? No, um, you don't have to be a good footballer at all. I think it's like they say, do you have to be a good um, have a good haircut to be a good hairdresser? And no, you don't. Um, you know, you don't cut your own hair necessarily. So um, maybe maybe you do during lockdown. Um, <laughs> no, you don't. And there are different areas you might want to get involved in, particularly because it encompasses its football development and coaching. We put the development first because that to us is more important and it's more of what we do as a trust than the coaching. The coaching is always going to be there and we are always going to be a football trust associated to the football club and it is important but it's um the development side of things is equally as if not more important so looking at how to manage projects whether they're football projects or um or otherwise community type projects there's there's lots of other areas um that you can get involved in and even if you do want to go into the coaching side of things you don't necessarily have to be the best you just use your um participants to demonstrate if you know if you're not going to be very good one of the old tricks of coaching <laughs> and then another question that's come in that says i'm really interested in learning more about sports studies at university but football isn't my main interest are there any general sports degrees i should be aware of there I'll ask are... laura i'll ask you that one first of all but carl and richard might have an opinion on that as well yeah so there are loads um if, if you're not already aware, the, the best place, if you're looking to go to university for a degree, the best place to look is on UCAS. Um, and if you just type in sport, it will come up with hundreds. You might even need to narrow it down to sports coaching, sports development, sports management, um, depending on what area you think you want to go in. But UCAS will bring up lots of different courses and then you can refine it to your local area or you can, can if you look on um, Discover Uni, which used to be called UniStats. It's how you can compare different universities and courses based on previous students' feedback. Um, so every student in their last year would have to complete a survey based on how they felt their course was based on certain things. Um, and that gets published for potential new students so they can look at honest feedback. So yeah, Discover Uni has got some really good information on if you're looking to compare courses and compare universities, but there are lots, lots out there. Um, as, as universities, Loughborough is the number one in the world 
for sport at the moment. Um, but there are others, Birmingham, Bath, Exeter are all really good for sport as well. So there are, there are lots of, but yeah, you just need to do a bit of research. Yeah. Okay. Um, Carl, any sort of names of universities that spring to mind that you know offer perhaps really good courses or, or programmes? Um, I'm glad Laura mentioned Loughborough. My wife went to Loughborough, so she, uh, she'd be happy to hear Laura say they're number one. Um, I think, you know, uh, from my experience and, and working with the, uh, the Football Association of Wales, the University of South Wales um, has some brilliant new modern facilities and they work with a lot of uh, EFL English Football League trust uh, organisations to uh, in partnership and their program uh, degree program was written by a couple of friends of mine who have been both been involved came through a similar route to me and have now both got PhDs and are have been working at international and, and uh, Premier League level so it's it's really designed by football people with an academic um, background because they know what the industry wants as well so I, I can only speak from, from those guys uh, perspective but you know just broadly speaking Laura's um, outlook on this and their program is music to my ears as an employer because what we want is people with those kind of skills that that have some coaching background uh, so they can understand when they go to visit a club or a league or an individual what the coaching pathway is like what coaching uh, what challenges that, that, that are presented and they have an understanding for the grassroots volunteer coach but also project management budget management are all skills that we want from our our staff members we've got nine football development officers who have a different remit so all those skills that um, that laura mentioned are absolutely what we need ally two and i can't stress this enough is that your your academic qualifications aren't enough to get you past or maybe the application stage into the shortlist stage you're going to have to align that with some work experience some volunteering that shows that you've actually applied some of this and you can you can work hard and, and you can do your time and, and support your application with some real relevant experience. So, you know, the 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 the, um, the, 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 the program that Laura's talking about is absolutely music to my ears in terms of future employment and future employment in, into football. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, on, on that time, I've got another question that's coming on. Rich, I'm going to give you the first um, a dip at this one and then i'll ask laura and carl if they've got anything they want to add to it so the questions come in i want to get involved in sports mainly football when i'm older and i'm currently stuck between doing a levels or b tech national diploma or extended diploma in sports syllabus any ideas on what would be more beneficial going into the future richard what advice would you give um it's a really good question by the way Thank for you. me when i was that yeah so when when i was at that stage thinking about either b tech or a levels my decision was to go more towards b techs because it was more sort of subject specific in terms of um actually going into sports obviously a levels you'll do a variety of different different subjects um and for me personally like i say it might be different for different people um people go down different routes but for me um I felt like if I went through the BTEC route in terms of sports or football, um, it would put me in a better position when going to university and actually going for, a, again, either a football or sport specific um, university degree. Um, so for me, I'd probably go down the, the BTEC route um, if I was looking to go down a sporting route rather than A-levels from a, personally. Yeah, okay. And then, Laura, in, in terms of any prerequisites to get onto a foundation degree or your foundation degree program are there any particular subjects that you would or courses you would want your prospective students to have done yeah i mean in an ideal world either a, a b-tech in a sports related subject or an a level in pe um, but our entry requirements are quite low so it's it's um two a levels grade d uh, or four i think it is in the new system i can't get my head around it um or as a BTEC extended diploma, it's a pass, 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 pass merit. Um, so yeah, um, as far as answering the question, I would say it's a, it's a personal preference as to whether you choose a BTEC or an A-level. Typically, BTECs are a bit more applied and they're obviously a bit more specific into an area that you think you want to go into. So if you think you want to go into a sports coaching role, 
um, a BTEC might be better suited for you. But what I would say is um, whether you choose an A level or BTEC, just make sure that you really apply yourself and do the best that you can and get the best grades that you can so that if you do choose you want to go on to university you've got the grades that will get you to where you want to be For example if you decide halfway through your BTEC or your A level that you want to do physiotherapy you need to be looking at what those requirements are if it's two A's then you need to be you know make sure you work towards them or if it's a distinction distinction merit on your BTEC just make sure that you're pushing yourself to do your best regardless of if the BTEC or an A level. Okay and then Carl if I just twist that question slightly um because it's something you've already you've already referenced earlier are there is it more about the skills and qualities somebody has or is it more about any qualifications um physically that someone would have that would make them a good coach or enable them to to have a career in the industry? I, th I think, it, yeah, so it's a really good question, actually. I think it's, and it's a, it's a difficult one to answer. I think you need a, co a combination of, of both of those two things. Um, but having said that, I think the individual will, I think, make a path for themselves based on sometimes hard work, reputation, and committing to a um, initiative or a project, being reliable and demonstrating all the things that you would want from a good coach. And I think if even if that individual doesn't have the qualifications straight away, those things are like gold dust in terms of from an employer's perspective that you would want uh, any employer would want to have um, as part of their workforce. So. I think sometimes they can go, they don't have to go in, in, the, in a, the traditional order, if you like. You don't have to get your qualifications and then align all those skills. Sometimes you might have um, a really strong personality and a passion for coaching and the qualifications come slightly later. So sometimes there's not always one prescribed route into a coaching uh, role or, or, or profession. It's um, uh, sometimes they can take very different routes, but also ultimately, your passion and your commitment to whichever route you take will dictate how far you go. If you're not um, committed to getting your grades, working hard on your qualifications, or you're not committed to um, doing all the things I suggested in terms of doing voluntary work or working hard at your, your local initiative or your local club, then ultimately you won't achieve what you want to achieve. A lot of the, the work that we see from successful coaches has been done unpaid unrecognized um, but all that is doing is building your cv and your skills slowly but surely okay um oh, so this is a related question here how can i get some work experience doing sports coaching i'm still under 16. I mean, what would you say to someone who wants to get work do they have to get that sort of formal work experience that school would provide or are there other routes that someone could get work experience Carl? Well, certainly, we. I, I'm always surprised that we're not uh, um, we're not inundated with requests for work experience. We we have a um, two work experience students with us at the moment, um, who are their their work is absolutely relevant to the degree that they're doing, and slowly but surely, we've given them more uh, exposure to some of our projects, and if they've shown capabilities, which both these two individuals have we start to give them a little bit more a little bit more um experience and responsibility in, in some of our areas now so that's from us we can take uh, work experience people but also the work experience from a coaching perspective can be done at your local club learning the the, the basics of coaching and you may be lucky and find a really good mentor that you could work with at a, a local sports club from from us it's football obviously but your local sports club will more will be more often really welcoming of young people who want to start their career in, in coaching and put them with a, a relevant mentor that will help them learn the ropes and the basics of uh, coaching. And sometimes it can be really useful because you can expose yourself to, to coaching and all the challenges that it brings and it can either confirm what you wanted to do or it can maybe send you in a different direction and, and Laura's mentioned some of the, the areas um, in sport that there are so many paths now that you can take in terms of football and uh, a career in football. 
Okay, and then what well, question again, another one related to this one. Um, my two favourite sports are hockey and tennis. Do I need to get a qualification in football first, though, to be able to go into community sports? Um, Laura, I'm going to direct that one at you because I know that hockey is your one of your sports that you play, isn't it? it is, um, yeah. How transferable are um, our qualifications in particular sports? Um, I'll be honest, they're not really. Um, I don't know if Richard or Carl could probably can say a bit more about that. But yeah, you you you'll need to be registered with the the um, the national governing body for that sport to um to coach that particular sport so if you're interested in in hockey and tennis i would suggest you contact the um the relevant ngbs national governing bodies for hockey and, and tennis the lta um about getting your, your coaching qualifications for those particular sports you certainly don't need football as a starting point there are lots of opportunities in hockey and tennis actually um as well as uh, yeah football it's our national sport there are a lot of opportunities but there are other opportunities in, in hockey and tennis as well but if you're looking for a career in coaching to have a range of different coaching qualifications will also serve you well and um, so you know even at the trust there's a football community um charity there are opportunities to do um like richard mentioned pe in school so if you've got a hockey coaching qualification or trampolining or anything that adds to your CV, then it will put you in a better position for coaching coaching roles. Okay, good. Um, Richard, how does someone begin as a sports coach? So let's sort of forget the academic route for the for the time being, but somebody who's maybe 14, 15, interested in getting involved in football coaching, what should be the first things that they should be doing? Um, I think Carl mentioned it um, earlier, sort of around like volunteering. Um, so we, we get quite a lot of our volunteers actually up from participants through our programmes. So they might be on our, um, you know, player development centres or um, Premier League kicks programmes. And, you know, they've shown good attitude and commitment to the programme. And as they've got a little bit older, sort of around the 13, 14 years old, um, you know, we ask them if they or they come to us and, ask about sort of volunteering hours and we sign them up as volunteers and um, we sort of expose them to different programs a very small amount to start with but then as their sort of confidence grows um, we expose them to different types of programs and um, so I'd, I'd definitely say like volunteering um, especially at a younger age before you can do your qualifications is, is key because you get to meet so many different people and get to see different types of coaching, different types of coaching behaviours. And actually, when you, if and when you go on to do your level one, once you've completed that, you know all these people already, you've had all these experiences, and actually it probably gives you a little foot in, in the door ready to go once you have got that qualification. Yeah, and then, I mean, from a volunteering perspective, just we're talking about grassroots clubs, but presumably, and I don't want to talk on behalf of any PE teachers, here as well but presumably there would be opportunities within your own school to gain some experience um so i'm unfair to ask you because obviously none of you work in in schools but would that sort of experience put someone in good stead carl absolutely yeah i think um if you look at you know i can think when i would, was at school and starting on a on a maybe a, an interesting coaching i did a qualification at school and i was encouraged to help with the with a maybe a, a lower age group uh, school team, and I think all those opportunities are um, uh, available now. And I think you know teachers would be more than happy to support uh, an individual's uh, wish to get involved in, in volunteering. And I think for for young for young players, regardless of whichever sport, to have maybe one of the older um, uh, pupils you know, get involved in coaching their particular team or uh, is quite inspiring, I think, for, for some of the younger, um, for the younger pupils, I think. Yep. Often under okay. Um, I've got a question here about level one courses. Um, how, well, it's, uh, read it verbatim, how easy is it to pass a level one course? I assume that means in, in football, um, but it, it I mean, are level ones sort of pitched at a similar level across different sports? Are they are they aligned? What's the sort of requirements of them? Yeah, the, uh, the simple answer to that is yes. That 
the a lot of the, the governing bodies are, are on what's called a, a framework. So a level one in um, football and a level one in in another sport that's on the framework, you will cover some of the basic fundamentals. So the idea is to have some kind of um, uh, consistency across sports. So sports will understand what a level one coach can do and a level two, et cetera, et cetera. So th there is some consistency. Um, but for us, the, the, the basics really are around ensuring that the young players have uh, or are involved in a, a fun and safe uh, and uh, positive environment. And it's about setting that environment for the players to thrive in as much as anything else. But also add to that um, an emergency aid qualification and a safeguarding qualification as well it really enhances that, that view that we should make sure that a young player's first exposure to football is as enjoyable and as positive and as safe as possible. So it, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and anyone that's um, that's you know, attended our level one, they've always said that they're, they're really useful, opened their eyes, and if you stick with it, you'll get through it. Okay, and then one that's just come up, where do I find out about level one courses? So is there somewhere you, we can direct people to go to find out where those courses are available? Yeah, well, as I mentioned before, is that every county FA in the country has uh, a, a county football association. So if you d Googled the Hertfordshire Football Association and clicked on courses, that's where you will find out about um, relevant courses. Failing that, if you just went to the fa.com as well, that will probably redirect you. But it's very simple to find um, where your local level one courses are. But it's, it's probably worth adding at this point is that there will be a, a new course coming uh, from the FA, which were, is sits just below the level one, which acts as a bit of an introduction to coaching. And it's called the Playmaker. So again, Googling that, you'll find that the Playmaker, I think, starts at 14. Um, and gives you a real good introduction to to sport or football coaching, and that's available, I think, um, this summer. Okay. And then uh, Laura said earlier, if there's any particular sports you're interested in, look up the um, look up the national governing boards site. So if you want to look at, I mean, you could probably just Google tennis coaching courses, getting you or hockey coaching courses, and that would start to bring up a, a menu of opportunities and options that you've got for you. Um, another question that's come in, Richard, I'll ask this one to you. Could this, and I assume this being um, courses or perhaps learning to be a coach, maybe lead to a chance at playing pro or semi-pro football at a non-league side as well as coaching? So, well, I'm going to try and dissect that question. Does learning to be a coach make you a better player, first of all? I'm not sure. What do you think about that, Richard? It hasn't made me a better player so <laughs> uh, no definitely definitely not there's uh playing and coaching are i i think two completely different things like it does you'll see there are benefits if you have played at a high level that you've had experiences of um high quality coaches and learn from them as you're playing so there's definitely some pros from playing at a high level and trying to then go into coaching 100 percent. but there's no there's no reason why you can't start at the bottom and learn. Um, so I would say that no coaching courses don't make you a better footballer. But on the flip side to that, don't feel like if you're if you've got no you know strong experiences of playing football, don't let that sway you away from um, exploring the opportunities of football coaching. You can obviously learn on the courses and then vitally obviously learn through your experiences of coaching different programs or different grassroots teams so on the flip side of that i say don't swear away from it if you have no playing experience whatsoever so yeah yeah no okay um and the person who sent that question in if, if i haven't interpreted that correctly um send it in to me send it in again and i'll, I'll, I'll try and um re-ask the question um <laughs> another question what are sorry. the sorry Carl, go on. so it's just one thing what i would say though is that it, what, it, what coaching courses do, whichever sport it does, it helps break the game down. So it might not make you a better player, I think, but it will give you a better understanding of the game. Um, so I think there are a lot of professional players who who think that because they played 300 games or had 50 caps for England or whatever, that they can become a coach. And when they go on coach education, they understand that actually 
this has now become a it's about teaching the game or coaching the game and breaking it down and communicating it to players maybe with a lesser ability so what i've had from a personal experience is players say well actually it's made me rethink the game that i just did naturally and i now have to break it down into its component parts and then be able to teach about it so i think it helps break down the sport and you gain a better understanding going on your level one on your or your level two you will not well you might become a guy i don't know but it's not there to make you a better player that's certainly not not what it's what it's for no, no, okay all right now thanks for thanks for clarifying that um richard what are the challenges of being a sports coach sort of given the warts and all um version of, of what being a um, in, working in a community sports program what are the downsides of it I suppose when you first start out as a coach, like on a with a community trust or even a um, a grassroots team, for example, the start of the journey is quite challenging, and you might find it quite frustrating. So, um, I'll give you my example. See, when I finished university, I've obviously got a degree, but I've gone back in as a part-time coach, so I haven't jumped straight into full-time employment. I've gone back to the community trust with Watford as a part-time coach. Very limited hours. Um, driving from school to venues, um, different hours of the day from morning till late at night. Um, it, when you're doing it, it doesn't look that glamorous. Um, but what I would say is that obviously the, the more hours you build up, um, the more you're committed, the more you go above and beyond for that company or charity that you're working for, um, naturally your hours will build up. You'll get to meet more people. I think that's probably the vital thing. Um, so if I think back to when I first started, um, I'd obviously be working on the school team, but then I'd meet the project officer for the disability sports and then I'd meet the person that runs social inclusion. Um, and then naturally you just you're getting more hours, but more importantly, you're coaching across different programs and projects, which just broadens your experiences. Um, so if it doesn't feel like I say that glamorous and um, at the start, it will improve. And it's just all about your, your love of coaching and love of football and just willing to commit to them hours, the late hours and driving from venue to venue. Um, so it is challenging at the start, but it, it definitely gets better the more you do it and the more experiences and more people you meet. Yeah, that's it. and I think there's a, there's a real onus, isn't there, on people when they first get those opportunities as part-time or casual coaches to really take as many different opportunities as you as you can. Is that something that you found, Richard, or is it something that you find that some of your perhaps younger coaches struggle to grasp? I think, yeah, I, I think just try and, like I said, like I said um, a couple of times already, just just try and jump into loads of different projects and programs because it makes you adaptable. So if I give you an example, you you know, in the morning you might be trying to plan a session for thirty year four pupils in in a school to for a PE type lesson then in the evening you might go to your grassroots team you might plan for 16 players to be there and only seven turn up um, so these types of sessions definitely makes you very adaptable in terms of being able to think on the spot and go right I haven't got these many players what do I do next or even within your planning so your session planning which is really really important um, actually having a plan B so if this amount of players turn up, this is what I'm going to do if I don't have these. So I'd definitely say these types of experiences and these types of programs um, will definitely make you very adaptable as a coach, which as you go through the journey is actually really important um, to be very. Yeah, so I'd say that's probably the main thing I'd, I'd take from that. Yeah, OK, there's um, there's a couple more questions and then we're going to look to wrap it up. So if you have got any more questions that you want to ask Richard, Laura or Carl, please get them in, in the next couple of minutes. Um, I, think so, I think this is a question actually all three of you could answer. How do you get the opportunities to go and do coaching in America? So I think all of you have done something abroad. I mean, Laura, what were your experience? You did something abroad, didn't you? Um, so I did after I finished college, before I went to university, I took a gap year and i went to america and did camp america which i think is still going now um quite some time ago um but yeah so i did eight weeks working on a summer camp and it was a sports camp but it was obviously multi-sports so just yeah camp counselor i was 
Um, and then I did just a bit of traveling around America afterwards. So not not specific coaching, but there are loads of opportunities because camp um, in general is a big thing in the States that they have summer camps like uh, we have holiday courses. They just have camps where they pack their children off for the whole summer holidays. Um, but there are loads of different opportunities for, for working on those kind of camps. Um, and uh, and then beyond probably what um, Richard and Carl can tell you about their experiences. Yeah, Carl, how did the opportunity come about for you? Um, I think I, I was looking for uh, that next step into coaching. I'd been coaching part time at a Centre of Excellence, and and I was just looking. I, I'd heard so many people had done it, and I wanted to do it. Um, and just a simple uh, mm -hmm. research. Uh, word of mouth contacts etc etc um, and I, I work for a company called Challenger and the I, I think as much as anything apart from giving you what, four months or whatever it was of day-to-day -day coaching it, it's hard work I, I don't I, Richard and Laura probably uh, echo that it's not a holiday you're getting paid and you're seeing America and you're meeting some brilliant people it's hard work we would we would work five days travel on the fifth day have a rest on the sunday start um on the, on the monday and i didn't have any half day camps i all mine were full day camps and across 10 states that's pretty tiring but as much as anything you learn so much more about america because we stayed with families i don't know if the other guys did and i was pretty reticent about that at the start but you stayed with 10 families and it was absolutely brilliant um and some amazing stories about some of the places you see some of the families and, uh, and connections you make, but it's a brilliant grounding for um, for learning your your trade if you want to be a coach. Because one week you could be with a really um, a talented group of focused individuals, and the week after you could be working with um, very small children and you're you're babysitting, telling stories, and all sorts of stuff. So. At the end of that, you come out a much, much better coach and a, a much more rounded individual. Yeah. And then, and Richard, anything to add to that one? How did you get sent to Hawaii? Was that choice? Uh, no, yeah, I, I, it wasn't my choice. I mean, I would have loved it to be my choice, but I sort of got given it. But um, mine was similar with as UK International. So I think they're quite similar companies in terms of um, you go out there, you do a bit of a residential in terms of this is what we want from you when you are doing camps or working with grassroots teams out there. Um, and then you all get sent an email of where you're going. So when I opened up my email, it says I'm on the flight to Hawaii in the morning. So I've just got off a flight um, to LA and I'm on, I'm on another flight to Hawaii. And then, um, yeah, there's just a few of us that got to stay out there for six months. So we were we did three islands in total there. Um, and then similar to Carl's um, company is that you stay with host families um, and I'd say that's probably the best bit of it in terms of the experiences you meet different types of families um, with different beliefs different you know religions and it, it's, it's, it's a really really positive experience and then as well as that it's, it's it, like I say it's hard work in terms of long hours um, different age groups um, but in terms of what you learn about yourself as well as your coaching it was a really really good experience mm -hmm. and definitely grounded me a lot when i came back and wanted to obviously get into full-time um, employment within football definitely just got to get the right oh, company so that a travel. That'd, be my, that'd be my advice is you go search the right company um yeah. there are a lot of companies now uh, that, that do that uh, but you, you just got to research the right company and get um uh, word of mouth uh, recommendations that's that would be my advice yeah okay um final couple of questions then um laura i'm going to pitch this one at you first of all but what pathways are people likely to go on having completed a foundation degree course let's say they then top it up with a relevant full degree what sorts of careers might they go into um so it really depends if they if they go on to do the top up with middlesex in football development and coaching the, the expected pathway is to work for a similar role to um, perhaps Richard in a, a, a football trust or foundation, um, whether it's starting out as a casual coach and then working your way up um, to a project development officer or, ma or manager. Um, but th those are typically what we would expect. Um, but I mean, I think it really depends on the individual's aspirations. Some people might 
find their calling being an under sevens coach and not want to progress beyond that and I think that's absolutely fine I think it's important to say when we talk about pathways you don't have to become an elite football coach to you know to be good at what you do or to complete a pathway I think if you find your calling or your niche within that pathway then I think you know just go for it and there's no nothing wrong with staying where you are um, but yeah, not not just with football trusts and charities, but local authorities, potentially um, organisations like the um, Hearts FA or other um, NGBs, national governing bodies um, as well, Sport England, different organisations that are involved in sport. There's lots of different roles, um, be them sort of either admin or coaching roles. Brilliant. Okay. And um, I mean, Carl, what about for, for you, pathways for someone, once they get a, let's say they get a level one or they get a level two coach, coaching qualification, even if they don't stay in coaching, what sorts of opportunities might that open up from? What sorts of skills are people going to have been learning and practicing that might put them in good stead for, for, for the rest of their lives? Mm. Yeah, I think it, we, we I think we've probably all touched on some of those, you know, uh, resilience. Mm. You know, I, I think as Richard mentioned that, you know, your coaching plan, you know, that, that you planned on for, you know, one or two hours is going to go out the window if you turn up and the facility's booked or you have half of your players missing or someone's forgotten the kit and equipment or whatever. Um, resilience to be able to stick with that. That It's not glamorous sometimes on a, a wet Tuesday night um, on, a, on a muddy pitch or where you've got a challenging group that can be a, a real challenge. So resilience, I think, is one that you're going to need if you're going to be looking for a career in, in coaching. But we want people who are committed and open-minded to becoming uh, the best possible coach and individual they can be. I think teamwork is is often trotted out by um, uh, to young people about a really inter a good skill to be to, to committed to if you want to uh, get a good job. Uh, it's underrated with a team of 18 people and you have to be able to get on with people from different backgrounds, different skills, different ages, different roles. If you can't do that, you're not going to function in a team of whether that's coaches or in a county FA office or a, um, a local authority um, uh, department, as, as Laura mentioned. So patience, dedication, teamwork, communication, all the things that I think that the, the course that Laura talks about is, is going to teach you. So those would be the, the off the top of my head the key things that any good coach uh, is going to demonstrate okay so i'm going to summarize here and, um, and wrap up there's no more questions that have come in as i'm doing this i'm just going to put a poll up on the screen so if you're watching live at the moment um if you could just take the time just to answer this question um and this will help us determine how useful this session has been for you so, so the poll should be coming up on your screen now um Thank you. So just in summary, then sports coaching and or as we've looked at football coaching here, it's um, something that there's many perks for that um, Richard, Laura and Carl have spoken to you about. It's not just football, though. There are lots of different opportunities for you and lots of different sports and lots of things, even within a football club um, that are um, really useful skills to have. You should try and gain your own work experience. So whether that's talking to your local grassroots club, whether that's your local football club, your local tennis club, hockey club, gymnastics club, try and get, offer yourself up as a volunteer to give yourself a good grounding in that, first of all, um, possibly even within your school network as well. That could be a really good, valuable way of getting some experience. There are different routes into um, sports coaching as a, as a career. So you can follow the academic route and Laura's giving you a really, really good example of a course available in Watford that will give you a foundation degree, um, which may well be something that you want to touch on and you want to find out more about. However, there are opportunities outside of that academic remit. So you can continue to do it as a hobby perhaps, and then it can be maybe something that you concentrate on and focus on getting your specific qualifications as you go on. If you're interested in finding out about qualifications and courses within particular sports, just type in your, the sport you're looking for, um, find their national governing body, and there will be lots of information on their website about how you actually access those courses. Laura, I think just on that note, before we round up, could you, where would someone find out about the foundation degree course that you are offering? 
Um, if you go on to the trust website, so it's www.watfordfccsetrust.com forward slash degree, um, and then all the information is on there. Or alternatively, you can find us on UCAS or Middlesex University's website under their list of courses. Okay. Right, well, thanks ever so much for everyone for coming in and attending and asking some really good questions today. And we hope we've been able to answer them for you. And the poll results seem to indicate that um, you do feel better informed now about careers in, in sports coaching. So finally, thanks to Richard, to Laura and for Carl for giving up their time for joining us today. This session has been recorded, so it will be available to watch back. So if you want to watch it back or you've got family or friends who you know um, would be interested to find out more about careers in sports coaching the um, QR code if you take a picture of that now the one on your screen then you'll be able to access that they will be available via hop into those so hop into is our um, is our website and from there you would be able to access um, details about all the previous webinars that we've run as well uh, we've got one next week coming up on IT careers, which are very different uh, careers from the one we've focused today. Thanks again for your time. Um, have a fantastic summer and we look forward to seeing you again soon.